I'm so excited to get started um, our very first talk. So um, Ryan Young lives in Richmond, California with his wife, son, and cats, Marshy and Mochi. I hope we'll have pictures later. He likes playing guitar poorly. It says that here. It, this is not me criticizing <laughs> you before you even started to talk. <laughs> and watching the Warriors when they play at home. He works at Stripe as part of the Doc Strategy team. Please give a very, very warm welcome to Ryan with a talk, is it layer cake? I hope so, thinking in content levels. <clears throat> well, hello, it's good to be here today, uh, kind of breaking the ice. Uh, like Janine said, my name is Ryan Young and I'm a technical writer um, at Stripe. So today, I wanted to talk to you about users. Um, it seems like kind of a natural place to start. Um, since this conference is going to talk a lot about users, I'm sure a lot of other people are going to be talking about users. Um, and it's just good, obviously, for anyone who's building products to think about their users. Um, and it's something I'm kind of naturally curious about. I just like listening to people and hearing how they think and how they do things. Um, and then Stripe also has a very user's first mentality. So all of this means that I end up thinking about this question of who users are and what they want qu quite a bit. So it turns out they're, they're pretty normal people like you and me. Um, <laughs> um, and they're just trying to figure out how to do something. Um, and a lot of times it's, it's something for their job or maybe it's for their own business. Um, and in the case of Stripe, um, if it's a business, there's a lot of other stuff that these users need to do outside of Stripe to get people to like want to pay them, to give them money, which is the purpose that they're using Stripe for. Um, and when users visit these docs, they're at Stripe, they're usually looking just to just accept payments is a phrase that we hear a lot. So, but then what they actually want um, is it's often not just to accept a payment, it's they want to create a subscription service or they want to add a, a buy button to their website or create a checkout session for um, their product or figure out how to send invoices or something very specific. Um, but in, in their head, it's accept payments. Um, so we tried to anticipate this with our information architecture um, uh, and to kind of make sure that people are guided to the right places. Um, and Anyway, so all of this is another way to say that users have these jobs to be done, and they come to the docs because they want the docs to help them do those jobs. Um, and if the docs don't help them do those jobs, they get frustrated. Um, and how do I know that? Um, so we were lucky to have a pretty good CSAT system at Stripe, um, so we, we collect a lot of user feedback, and users leave a lot of feedback, which is great. And since I really like uh, hearing what users think, I started reviewing um, some of this feedback. Um, to see what they were saying when they were clicking the, the feedback buttons. And so they had a lot to say. Um, a lot of users were frustrated. Um, they felt like Homer. Um, but in, which was kind of dispiriting to, to, to see because, you know, why were they feeling like this? We, we tried really hard to make uh, good docs and uh, we tried to make them easy to use. We tried to make them full of the like, useful details. We tried to provide different um, kind of like bells and whistles with like different tabs and um, all all these different options and cool things that we thought uh, users wanted, like code samples, co copy paste stuff. Um, so we thought we were giving users what they wanted. Um, so why were they still getting frustrated? Um, so. In the feedback, I, I saw some themes kind of start to emerge. One was that there were too many options. We provided too many options. Um, we, you know, we, as writers, we want to make sure that users understand like all the choices they have when they come to uh, docs and where, where things are at. Um, so there's a, a ton of options scattered throughout the docs in different ways, but there's so many that it starts to feel kind of overwhelming for a user, especially when you thought you're just gonna do one thing. And even worse, we were inconsistent in the ways we were telling users how to get started, like this user is mentioning. Um, so these users were facing a lot of choices and um, the choices felt like they were contradictory or mutually exclusive even when they weren't. 
And this was happening throughout the information architecture. And it was also happening in individual docs where we, that were supposed to be straightforward guides to tell users how to do something, like an integration guide. And in those, we provided inline options, but those are hard to parse if you're trying to do something and then you have to sort of jump out of that context and start to make a choice. Um, and it just kind of uh, ruins your flow of just getting the thing done. Uh, another theme was that there was too much information users can't utilize. So, it, again, we're, we were trying to um, provide what we thought users needed, which was information, and trying to provide as much of it as possible, because um, that seemed like a good thing. But sometimes it just doesn't matter how much information you squeeze on a page, because even if the doc does have the right information, sometimes users, they just can't utilize it they might not understand the context or they might not understand how to actually apply it to their problem. So this user seemed to understand that they'd landed on a guide that probably actually did answer their question, is probably had information that he, he needed to integrate with Stripe, but there just wasn't anything that they could do about it. Uh, another theme was we sometimes the docs had the wrong scope. It was either too broad or too specific. Um, so sometimes the user needed details when we were providing context. Other times they wanted context when we were providing details. <clears throat> so in this case, uh, there, these are um, this feedback from two different users, and one user was looking for the broad view on how to do the the entire integration. Uh, and the other user, user has a pretty specific question about testing the integration. So unfortunately, we ended up kind of failing both of these users um, by not providing the right scope. Uh, too technical um, was something we heard a lot. Um, so our product, it was initially targeted at developers. And the idea was to get developers um, started by just writing like a certain number of lines of code and just get started as quickly as possible. Um, and that's. That is still the goal and for developers, but we, we're starting to see like a new type of user who weren't exactly, they weren't non-developers. <laughs> um, <laughs> but people who did get frustrated a little easily. Um, um, so, but, so these people, they were just people who just didn't want to invest time in, in writing code to get started quickly. So some were tech adverse and um, felt overwhelmed and like th this was just not for them in very emphatic ways. Um, but we also were seeing feedback from really technically adept users who had really like nuanced uh, feedback and they, they obviously understood the technical details but they just didn't want to take the time right then to write code for a payments integration because for them, the payments were a side project. It was just one small part of their, their overall business. They were writing complex code for their own businesses and their own projects. Um, sometimes the docs just weren't providing the, the right information. This happens in all docs. Sometimes it's just not there what the user is looking for. Um, and sometimes we just, and we sometimes we fail to anticipate what a user might want if it wasn't the main thing that we were providing. Um, and then, so not only was the specific information this user wanted not on the page, we didn't. We actually we also didn't provide any links or hints of how to get to other resources that might help them to move forward in their product and get uh, get their job done. Um, and this is another common theme was not, it, was, it wasn't clear where to start or where to go next. So a lot of docs are understandably focused on getting started, getting the user started with something uh, quickly and easily. And, you know, we've invested a lot of time in making that happen. And, but when the user is done with that initial getting started guide, they, they need to know what the next step is. And the docs really need to be clear about that. Um, so this user had, you know, a very reasonable use case of what they want to do. Um, seems like a good idea. Uh, but we just didn't anticipate something like that well enough. And we, again, we didn't really provide a link in the right place um, to help guide users to docs that we do have to explain what they want to do. Uh, but we just didn't help them get to where they needed to go. So 
I was looking at all this feedback, and there was, I was thinking about it, and um, they started to kind of evoke something in me that was like a little nostalgic and <laughs> uncomfortable in a, a weird way, and I couldn't quite place it. But then I started thinking about malls, um, <laughs> which you might remember malls. They were, they were really great um, <laughs> when I was a kid, um, and they seemed like they were everywhere, um, Kindergarten Cop and other movies. Um, <laughs> So, uh, so I, I grew up in the suburbs, so I went to the malls a lot, and it was kind of the, the one thing to do. And one thing, I, I, I just have this very distinct memory of walking through the malls, and you enter, and there's the perfume section, everyone's spraying perfume at you, and there's makeup, and it's bright lights, and, it just, and then you kind of go into the main part of the mall, and there, you see all the stores. And as a kid, it just felt like a very disorienting um, experience. Um, and it, it struck me that that's... It felt like that's some sort of like what the users were experiencing with the docks. And I also remembered at the mall, uh, one thing that I liked at the mall was the, uh, the store directory because it had a map, had a list of all the, the stores there, and it just kind of it showed you that you were here, and it just was very clear and um, kind of took, took away some of that disorientation. Um, so and then I thought maybe this is what was missing from our docks. Maybe we didn't provide a map, or maybe we did, but it was at the wrong resolution. Um, so we've provided these really granular, low-level docs, um, and then we provided these very high-level um, overview docs that didn't really have a lot of details. Um, but it seemed like there was something missing. So, um, so thinking about docs is like that. Let's look at some maps. So. If, if, you, if you've never, um, the, the mall um, by uh, where I grew up was called the Brea Mall. Um, we went there all the time. And if you've never been to Brea before, but you want to go there to visit now, because it's great, um, you, you'd look at Google Maps. This is the kind of map you'd see. Uh, it shows you the streets and the freeways and you get an idea of like maybe the parking situation. You see where the Crumble Cookie Store is. And so you know where all that stuff is. Um, and you could zoom in a little bit more, or you could zoom out to see your route. But if you're from the, from the area, like I was in my family, um, maybe this kind of map is what you actually want. You just want to know where, where the stores are. You forget exactly where the pennies is, and you want to, that's where you want to park by. So this might be helpful to you, because you don't need the street names. You know where it is. Um, and then once you arrive at the mall, um, this is the kind of map that you want, because um, Maybe it's like you're, you're 12 and you're with your parents and you're trying to strategize how to, how to find each other later on and you want to know where the hot topic is or something. <laughs> so, um, and then finally, then you, you get into the mall, you're there. Uh, and then at this point, you don't need any maps, right? You're, you're just there. But you, you, you do have signs um, to guide you. Um, and so you're not completely lost there. There's still... Um, some help for you. Uh, and if you get really lost, you could always go back to those maps and directories. But you don't need that right now, because the sunglass hut is right there. And that's what you wanted. You wanted to get some sunglasses. So, um, so in, you're inside the store. And, but even inside the store, there's, um, things are organized in a way that's catering to your use case. You're buying sunglasses. So you see there's a sale. You see there it looks like there's a Ray-Ban rack. That's what you want. So cool, you got some sunglasses at the mall. Um, You've done your job. Um, so that was a fun trip to the mall. Um, <laughs> so we, we, know, we know that users would generally prefer not to read the docs at all. <laughs> uh, as, much, as much as we don't want to say that. But, um, so we strive to create things, create products and services that uh, ideally don't really require any instruction that are just intuitive that users can just pick up and, and use. But sometimes you just you, you do need to read the docs. And a lot of times when users come to the docs, it's because they're a, you're a little lost. You want someone to show you the way. So in that way, docs are kind of maps for users before their instruction. So, and, and users are looking at all aspects of the docs to help guide them through their job to do. Um, so, Thinking about this with, with the user feedback that I, I was seeing, um, it, it felt like 
this is what we thought we were giving to users. Um, but this is actually <laughs> what we were giving users. So what, what was missing? So this is what we had. We had the high-level docs, and we had the low-level docs. We had the high-level content. This is the kind of stuff that's helping users understand where they are and where they might need to go or where, where they um, want to go next to do their jobs. So this is kind of like the, the mall directory. It, it, it tells you you're here, and this is where everything else is. Um, and it has all the information. So this is our docs homepage. And there's a lot going on on this page, and there's a lot of cool little bells and whistles. But what I want to focus on is content-wise is that one of the main things that we're trying to do here is we're trying to direct users to the specific docs that will match their use cases, to match with the, the jobs that they came to the docs for. So like I said, m most users come to Stripe to accept payments is their, the main use case. So the main call to action button there uh, is get started with payments, and that takes users to a, a detailed guide um, that helps them get started quickly. Um, it provides code samples, and uh, again, it goes through that getting started flow. Um, and then in those three body columns there of like no code, Stripe hosted for developers, uh, each of those links takes users to similar guides um, for the jobs that are described there, like sell and get paid online. You, you go directly to a guide that um, explains how to do that. Um, and we also provide escape hatches to other resources, like the API reference, client libraries, and developer tools. Um, so if a developer just wants to uh, dive directly into the API reference, um, they could do that. Uh, and there's, there's a, again, there's other, a lot of other cool stuff on this page, but I don't have time to talk about it. Um, so we, and we follow this pattern of just pro providing kind of the um, overview pages as the um, the, the, the high-level content as the scope gets narrower of, of um, the top topics that we're covering. So here's our landing page for, for payments. So we're, again, linking to specific guides for use cases. Um, and again, if this sounds like too much for, um, or too technical for, um, for some of those like non-technical users that we're seeing, we have the banner up there that um, takes them to uh, our no-code docs, which I'll talk about later. Um, plus, we still have all the same escape hatches from before. And here's just another example of a, another kind of high-level overview page. This is kind of an index of uh, different payment scenarios and different use cases that are beyond just kind of the getting started in one. So at the high level, we have this type of content. It, it doesn't tell you how to take the first step, but it helps you find the doc that does explain how uh, to take that first step. So these pages are kind of navigation aids. They're high level maps. And then we have the low level content. And this is kind of the bread and butter of uh, tech writing. It's, it's what most tech writers, I think, work on most of the time. Um, and it's, of course, on this kind of content, you want to focus on execution and accuracy. And it's, you're, you use this kind of content when you're, like, re you're ready to roll up your sleeves and solve the problem. And users typically, when they're here, they know where they are and where they're going. They have a decent understanding of which products and services um, they're using and the scope of their work um, to create the integration. So they're ready to start writing code. They're ready to start clicking buttons. Um, and a lot of times, actually, like in the story here that we saw, the best place for this information is with, within the product. So like tool tips or man pages, things like that. So you don't want users to have to click back and forth between the, the tool and the docs. Um, but we can also make the docs immersive. And we've done that with these quick start guides that you can browse the steps and the code side by side, um, which is great. And then even further than some places, we, we can embed some functionality from the UI into the docs and makes it even easier for users to stay in one place. Um, and for the same workflow, we have a sort of flip version of that immersive quick start, which is kind of a text-based guide. Uh, but that still gets down to business pretty quickly um, with copy pasteable code samples. And again, um, because users at this point, they, they know what they're doing. Um, and then we also have the API reference, of course, and it has tons and tons of information. 
And this is the kind of thing that you need when you're in the weeds of a project, when you want to know uh, what, what are all the, the fields you could pass on a, a customer ad address object, for, for example. And so we have, we have all of that there, um, exhaustive detail, and you can see some example data on the right. So, so we have a pretty good idea of what the low level content here is and the types of content that live there. These integration guides, quick starts, references, kind of information dense uh, content. <clears throat> so again, so we have the high level, the low level, and we have some idea of, kind of the kinds of content that go into those levels. But uh, like Homer's ice cream, we seem to be missing something. So what's, what we seem to be missing is kind of a middle level because um, you again you hear about high level content, low level content, but you don't hear about like middle level content. Um, it's not a thing as, I, as far as I know. Um, so what when what would that kind of content look like? Um, high level content is helping orient users like a mall directory. The low level content is helping users implement their project. So maybe the middle level content would help users make decisions uh, to determine what their next step is. So at this point, maybe they've, they've made the decision to click one layer down from an overview page, but they're not quite ready to write code or click buttons. So this content, maybe it's kind of a bridge. So think of an engineer at a small company who's asked um, to just start charging customers. So they'll want to get to the low level details eventually. They'll want to um, jump into that API reference at some point. But first they need to understand the scope and the shape of their integration and maybe to discover things that they don't know about what's going on because this is a project that's new to them. So this is maybe something like a map of one floor of the mall or it's like the vantage point you get from like the second level at a mall. Um, where it's something that you're still orienting users, but you're starting from like a little bit lower layer than the landing pages and the overview pages. Um, it, and providing more content, a little bit more depth and more actually usable information. Um, and we're still presenting options, of course, but we're helping the user understand how to reason about those options rather than simply presenting them as a list. So because of the feedback that we were seeing from users, um, we decided we needed some like dedicated docs for no code users. So when we started working on these, we of course designed a landing page that follows the same design pattern as the other um, high level overview pages. And we created low level docs that were appropriate for these non-technical users, like how to create payment links here. Um, and we took advantage of the embedded UI functionality again, because that seemed like it would be good for these users. And we also, and then we also have the text steps of, to reinforce the connection between the actual process and what the user's um, doing in the UI. And we also um, created um, kind of a middle level doc here. And the purpose of this doc was to help users who might only know a couple of things, which was that they don't write code, but they want to use Stripe for something payments related for their business. So we created a page that gives them some options and then walks them through what those options mean and then tying them all to common use cases for no code users. So we list the use cases first since that's probably a user's primary reason for coming to Stripe um, and to this page particularly. And then we also list all of the pieces of typical integration, so defining each piece and providing some context for it because Another thing that we heard was that users felt like we were using um, technical jargon, so we wanted to make sure that this was clear and uh, well-defined for them. And then we dig into the actual use cases we listed at the beginning, so, and we contextualize the use case, we give an example, uh, we show a, a couple of jobs for the use case, um, and then we list all the integration pieces that you need for this um, particular, particular use case. Um, and if you click on one of the jobs, it expands to explain the overall process that you need to go through to get that done, and it links out to more detailed docs. Um, so what did users think? They actually liked it, um, and it seemed to do exactly what they needed. This user was starting a new business, and they needed to um, get the overall kind of lay of the land, uh, and this doc did that for them. This user appreciated the specific use case. 
Um, and we just weren't seeing the same frustrated comments about things being too technical. Um, people actually seem to understand the things at this level. Um, some users were very excited, um, which was <laughs> great to see. Um, and of course, not everything was 100% positive. Um, we did get some complaints. Uh, but here, the, the, the user is reasonably saying that we were kind of missing a key use case. Um, but even here, um, we were able to kind of take, leverage the, the pattern um, to fill in the gap as soon as the functionality became available. So a tech writer who kind of wasn't involved in the initial creation of the, these no-code docs was able to just copy the pattern and add that in um, when, it, when they were possible. Um, so it's something, it's a pattern that we've used to um, document kind of complex use cases. Um, Usage-based billing is something that is very complex and error-prone, so we're able to um, use some of the same elements here uh, to kind of help uh, orient the users and understand all all the things that they would need to think about uh, in the course of their integration. Um, and we've also, sometimes we've struggled to kind of collectively exp explain broad kind of um, what my boss calls caramel ribbon concepts that kind of spread across Stripe and the docs. So, and uh, this new pattern kind of made it easier to explain things like that, um, like recurring payments. Um, there's different ways to do it on Stripe. Uh, Subscriptions are in the main way, but there's other things that people often want to do. So we use the common use cases again, um, and then use kind of different perspectives to say like uh, different types of um, recurring payments, and then you provide a kind of a compatibility matrix by product if um, that's what users wanted. Um, so that's the middle layer. So we have these types of docs um, kind of design your integration, use case-based docs, um, things that could help ex explain complex use cases or um, a broad uh, concepts. So now we have these three levels of content in our framework, um, but we, we kind of need a name for these. So uh, I borrowed some ideas from uh, Wayfinding to, uh, to give names to them. So the, thinking of the high level uh, as orientation layer level, the middle one as the decision level to help users reason about the options that we're presenting, and then finally the implementation level. Um, and yeah, that's the, um, the kind of framework that we, we worked out. Um, and you could kind of imagine a user journey going up and down the levels. Um, and maybe they're entering one, and maybe that's the only one they stay on, but it's just good to... Um, understand kind of the, the full full stack of it. So our, our, our docs layer cake, um, so, you know, w some of them are. Um, we re recently want, launched some new docs. Um, this is for a new kind of product suite. We, so we have the overview, the high level pages. Um, oops, and the low level pages, but um, we, we, are, we are missing that middle level right now. We're, we're like kind of reasoning about how to like make decisions about how to use the full breadth of this. So what's next? Uh, we're, we're just gonna keep on building out this framework and our own docs. We're gonna keep on talking to users, evaluating its success, see how well it, it works, and then um, uh, updating our docs based on the user feedback, and then we'll keep on doing that same cycle. So that's the level of content framework. So, and that's my talk. Thank you very much. I'm saying, have a seat. All right. Be casual, <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much for that. We hear so much. Um, I think Stripe has a lot of fans, and it's really cool to see how. Uh, it all gets done because it looks so sleek when you first log in. Mm -hmm. um, so if you've got questions, we're taking them on Slido. So you might have seen the QR code on your way in. If not, you can go to, I think it's just slido.com, S-L-I-D-O. 
Um, and you can put in WTD 2023 to submit some questions. And also we've got Swapnil, so um, if your Wi-Fi isn't working, you can wave him over and he'll come and get your question. We do have a couple already. So Brooke is wondering, how did you collect user feedback on your docs? Any methods you prefer more than others, like conducting user <coughs> interviews or having thumbs up or down on pages? Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. So we, um, like on every page, we do have the thumbs up, thumbs down mechanism, and then there's a, a prompt. Um, we recently changed it so that there's, depending on if you choose thumbs up or thumbs down, um, you get some um, multiple choice questions of like, you know, it wasn't clear, didn't have the inaccurate or whatever, and then you have the chance to put free text in. Um, and, and that does yield pretty good um, feedback. It's of course a little biased because you, users do ten, tend to provide feedback when they're frustrated or <laughs> feeling a little negative. Um, but but uh, the users do feel if you know there's um, if you filter out the, the noise that there's a lot of good signal in there. Um, user interviews are definitely really really good, and that's probably the best. But it's also the most time and resource intensive. Um, just talking directly to users, asking them to share their screen, walk, walk you through that. Um, and that's one of the best ways to kind of just understand it through a user's eye so what they're trying to do. Yeah, I've made the mistake of collecting um, not enough context. So you got a thumbs down, you go, what does it mean? Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> awesome, thank you. Um, from JP, at what layer do you see most new users coming into the docs? What layer has the most drop off? That's a good question. I don't, I don't know about drop off question, but I mean, I think the, the, the orientation level is probably where most users start because that's kind of where we intend for them to start. Mm -hmm. um, but I have seen some interesting feedback um, of some, some people who were kind of going through some of these flows and it seemed like what they actually wanted was to go right to the decision level. Um, where they said they kind of prefer that to be where the, where we had the overview page, which was an interesting feedback. So, um, yeah, so monitor that and see. Yeah, awesome. Um, what key metrics do you track or use to measure effectiveness, and how often do you collect and review? It's always a million-dollar question. Um, I mean, constantly collecting and, and reviewing in different ways. Um, and, and there's, I mean, there's no... For key metrics, you know, it's, it's always just a collection of things. It's the um, the, sub the subjective feedback from the the CSAT responses, and then um, then you could just look at like page views, and you could kind of triangulate like if a page has high page views and high um, dissatisfaction, that's something's probably wrong with that one. Um, yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Um, a hard hitter from Nathan. When you get negative user feedback, how do you know if it's a docs problem or a product problem? But, Fighting words yeah. from Nathan. Um, it, you know, I guess, I guess it definitely, I definitely would try to make sure that it's not a docs problem first um, to see if it's, <laughs> uh, you know, that it's, it, it's not something that we missed or explained incorrectly. Um, and then it, you kind of just going through uh, retracing a user steps to see um, was this something that was I could do, but it just wasn't explained well, or is it something that just you cannot do? Um, um, so uh, uh, one example about like um, user feedback is that we had uh, a page that was getting an okay number of page views and then but it was like 100% negative and that and so we're like what, what is going why is this it seems okay uh, but it was because the it was a it was a beta feature and then users had to be gated into that beta feature and so they, when they're going into the UI they weren't seeing the, the, the buttons that we we're explaining and so so that that was kind of a combination docs product problem I think but I think it also helps the rest of us to know that that sort of thing also happens uh, at a place like Stripe. I think we all take a whoo, <laughs> have to relax. Um, and I think we're going to try to uh, 
catch up on some times, we'll do one more um, from Andrew. How does this framework fit with the traditional content types like references, guides, tutorials? Are there duplications of content issues with a middle layer? Um, yeah, I mean, there, I, don't, I don't think there would be a lot of duplication, to be honest. I mean, maybe you, you might reuse some content um, from like a lower layer in like a decision level um, doc. Um, but I think the main thing of the context, the main difference between that concept task reference kind of framework is that it's, I feel like that's more from an author's perspective and this one is more, uh, or at least I hope is more from a, like a user's perspective. So it's, um, yeah, it's, it's more about like what the user is trying to do rather than how the author is trying to like organize the content. Ooh, good answer. <laughs> cool. Well, thank you so much, Ryan. Um, I'm there, we, we weren't able to get to all the questions. You were very popular. People always want to know how they can be you when they grow up. Um, <laughs> are you good with people coming up and finding you to talk more? Yeah, absolutely. Amazing. Look for this guy <laughs> out there. Thank you so much. Thank you.